we've been addressing in, in different respects is really what is law and what is the foundation for law and what is it that determines uh, how law really works. And we've been approaching it from different directions without really maybe expressing it in that way. What is it that determines what is law, what becomes law, how long it remains law, and how the law is actually implemented? These are all a set of questions. We had a wonderful discussion about a year and a half ago in Dubrovnik uh, with Saulo, who's a federal judge in uh, Brazil. Uh, and uh, he gave a wonderful explanation that as a trial judge, uh, how clear it is that there is no such thing as objective law uh, divorced from the subjective dimension. Because every time the law is applied, it's applied by an interpretation. And the application involves an interpretation. Uh, and uh, it may be subtle or it may be uh, very significant. Uh, that interpretation of how the law is applied according to the socioeconomic status of the person, according to the severity of the act, uh, none of which is clearly defined in the law, according to the intentions of the individuals involved, which itself is ex all subjective. We have no way of measuring it objectively. Uh, and it was a real uh, it was a beautiful example of the fact that you cannot separate the subjective and the objective aspects of the reality, which is what we've been saying to the economists yes. for the last seven <laughs> years, and now it came full circle uh, and to law as well. And I'm not saying this with the purpose of uh, uh, diminishing the value of law in any way. I'm trying to put it back in the human context and really see, unlike the laws of motion, which presumably don't respond as directly to our intentions, our motives, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, universal good and truth and right and human values, uh, they function somewhat autonomously. But that's not the same for the laws of economics or the laws of society. I think it's useful for us to explore uh, without trying to come to simplistic generalizations and really understand law uh, in a social context. And one of the papers that we wrote together some five years ago on global rule of law, uh, we had a number of interesting discussions on that. And one of them was that the fundamental basis of law in society is what the society accepts as acceptable. We called it the public conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, what the, and that may determine what's put into law, or the law may be more absolute, but the way the law is actually implemented uh, depends on really what the, the people believe. When I first went to India back in 1971, one of the things that struck me, I came from California, and I don't know if it's changed since then, but when I was growing up, the idea that most people paid their taxes was a pretty, uh, pretty much taken for granted. Uh, I mean, there was always those who did moonlighting and stuff like that, but the idea that within law, that is, you paid your taxes, if there was a way to get out of it legally, you did. But within the law, the idea that uh, was very different from in India, where the so why would you want to pay taxes? And I mean, the, the, the very intention was to evade taxes in any way you could. And I, the contrast in attitude, it's not that we want to pay taxes here, but uh, you almost were frowned on, you pay taxes. We even started a company in South India, and when we went to uh, uh, register with the uh, public authorities for paying employee taxes, they said, why do you 
No, 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 don't come and register to us. We have much bigger companies than yours that are not paying. You'll get us in trouble if you, <laughs> if you start paying. And then I started thinking about the history of it. Well, in England, in India, taxes was what was imposed by a foreign ruler for hundreds of years, and it was almost patriotic not to pay taxes. <laughs> and even after uh, freedom, you had a British administration, which was a very high quality and actually uh, quite honest, uh, non-corrupt administration. You had the Indian, but it was a colonial administration designed to rule, govern, control uh, uh, a subject population. And when the Indians took over that administration, and many of them had served under the British as well, but the next generation, the Indian administration behaved in the same way towards the population as the British pop administration had done, even though now it was theirs. But the authority of the ruler and the submission of the, the public, and gradually, grad, very gradually, that's changed over time. So, it just goes, uh, it illustrates the fact that the relationship between the law, the principle, and how it's applied, what is sanctioned by this, depends very much on what's sanctioned as acceptable by the society. We see now in India that uh, 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 rape, for example, and, and other things, which was historically tradition, uh, uh, and if there was a, uh, I mean, these things weren't even reported in the newspapers. Uh, nobody, they, the police refused to even register cases going back in history. It was almost like the right, the right of the wealthy or the influential uh, to do what they wanted. Now, it's come to the public conscience, it comes to the, uh, the media, uh, it goes into the courts, people lose their jobs. You see, what's changing is not the law. It was always illegal. <laughs> but what's changing is what the public tolerates. And we're seeing that with the Me Too here. Uh, it's the same thing. So I think to, to understand that the relationship between the society and the law and the way the law is uh, implemented is a, is a useful insight in our discussions about governance and also the fact it's much more complicated as, uh, as Winston and Lloyd and others will if we open it up for discussion. But I think at any one point in time, then the question is, what's really determining how the law is implemented? Or even what is accepted as law? And we had a long discussion about this, that it seems to be some kind of a balance between the tradition of the past, which hasn't agreed to change yet, the resistance to change of the past, and the ideals of the future, which have been accepted as ideas, but not yet accepted as practice. And uh, maybe a, a, the most obvious example of that is goes back to the Declaration of Independence and the uh, the Constitution, uh, when when slave owner slaveholders were saying that all men are created equal, but, but of course they really meant all white men, and by men they really meant only men <laughs> with property, with property, with well, property, with property. <laughs> with property. <laughs> And uh, if you trace the history of the abolition of slavery, it's a fascinating history in Europe. The simplest way is just go to Wikipedia because you'll see there's a timeline starting from about 1700. From 1700 to, to 1860 uh, when the Civil War came, every year almost uh, there are landmarks of the countries in Europe uh, making slavery at home illegal, then making slavery, the slave trade illegal, then making slavery in their colonies illegal. Uh, and it, in fact, many of the US col American colonies also made it illegal uh, before even the war of, uh, of, war of independence. Uh, but not all. And there was a compromise, a compromise at the time of the Constitution. 
uh, as to because if we hadn't had that compromise, we would have never had 13 colonies becoming uh, a country. And yet, 160 years after this movement started, when the direction of the movement was in, incontestable because it was worldwide, it was even in Russia, it was even in India, and it was a worldwide movement, yet we fought a war that almost destroyed the US. We fought a war not just over whether slavery should continue, but the war was actually fought over the demand of the southern states that they should be able to extend slavery to new territories as they became states, that we could extend slavery. So we had an old, an old impulse still trying to extend itself when the whole world was giving it up. Uh, and I think that shows the tension that's there implied in law at any particular point in time. And maybe if we want to go in that direction, it may give us some insights into what's going on in the US today. Because we fought the war not at the time uh, that it was really a question of going back, but at the time when the movement, the inevitable movement forward raised the resistance of everything that didn't want to give up the past. And maybe that helps us understand something about what's going on in the US now, 27 years after the end of the Cold War. Uh, we, uh, we have all the things we thought we had given up but long ago there, coming. There are always historical events that trigger those feelings back. Um, because those feelings don't disappear just because on the surface we get somewhere. They're at deeper and deeper levels. And that's what I that's why I mentioned it, because a hundred after Europe, after all, we had under students of the past, even when we uh, wrote the Constitution, 70 years later still, yeah, but let's go, we can go for another 100 years, we can go. I think we see law more as a reflection of the psychology and the sociology of the society, not as a fixed, clear thing. This is the law on paper, but how it gets enforced how it's interpreted uh, is, a, is, a, is another thing. And uh, I'm not diminishing the value of law. Rather, I think it shows how central law is as a social institution for our process of negotiating what we accept. And so you've got at one end the raw social power, which we're going to discuss in the next uh, session, which really the law is, well, it's mine, I have the power, nobody can take it away from me. That's how law was, that's the rule of the jungle at the other end. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got a conception of ideas, of principles, of rights, of ideals. And where we are in this spectrum, between the raw exercise of power at the one end and the ideal at the other end is always somewhere in between, and the way what's written on paper is actually, what's written on paper and how it's implemented changes. And what Winston talked about, the, the human rights, uh, the, the charter. The Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah, so, uh, that's an example of this. For the first time in history, major countries of the world came together and agreed in principle to rights which nobody was fully implementing. <laughs> And nobody was ready to fully implement them, but they were ready to accept them and put them down. And now we're doing that with the SDGs, which go way beyond the original human rights because it's doing what FDR wanted to do. It's really translating them into economic and social rights and not just political rights. But this is a process. And if we understand that process and we understand what, what drives that process, and what direction it is, then we have to understand how does it evolve, and how do we evolve, how do communities evolve as a species. And if we do that, then we can think about how we can accelerate that process. And we can also maybe understand a little better some of the complexities and apparent reversals 
or uh, rejections that we get and the tensions that are there in, be in between. So all of this I'm trying to say, I think there's been a very rich discussion and it's not easy to, uh, uh, to define it because we are looking at these issues in a very subtle, but I, a way that really comes to the reality. Uh, there's another point that uh, uh, in that same paper that Winston and I did, he, you mentioned micro law yes. this morning. One of the interesting things we have to think about between law and governance is who really determines the law? And in that paper we gave the example, which I'm sure most of you or many of you are familiar with, of Rosa Parks refusing to get uh, move her seat on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> and the result was that the bus driver who didn't want to but was forced by law to call the police, get her put it before the judge, and the judge who didn't want to but was forced by law to fine her $8, uh, uh, which she refused to pay and went to jail uh, instead. And the result was that the black community of Montgomery in mass decided to boycott the buses. And it turned out that about two thirds of the customers on the buses were black. <laughs> and within about, I forget now, uh, whether it was, I think it was about a year and a half, the bus company was going broke. <laughs> and the city of Alabama, uh, of Montgomery, decided that they had to modify the law, they had to change the law simply because their public transport system uh, would go out of business. And I, I think the interesting thing about this was in a, in a few instances, not always, but in, we could actually trace back the process to the individual who acted. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not true that uh, it's not one individual. In fact, the history is before Rosa Parks, there were several other people who protested, and uh, it didn't work. Uh, and after Rosa Parks, there happened, she was fortunate that there was a new young clergyman in Montgomery uh, named Martin Luther King who wanted to make a name for himself. But the role of the individual, this law seems to be so impersonal, so vast, it's unrelated to the individual. But the actual process by which new law is determined and new values are put into the law and the way the implementation of the law is changed is a law is it an act of individuals? Individuals. Collective behavior. Individual behavior, pioneering behavior that changes and influences others and builds into a collective behavior and then translates into either a new law or a different way of interpreting the law. So we connect not only the law with the society and with our attitudes and our aspirations and our values and our ideals, but we also connect the law with the collective, with the individual. Uh, and that's the, when Winston said in his very pithy summary of uh, Laswell's work that the, the constitutional and the power process are based on a social process, uh, I, this is what's involved with, this is, the law, this is the living law, not the law in the, in the book. This is the living law that's been evolving through time and is one of the greatest institutions that, uh, that we have evolved to make mentally explicit uh, and to more and more subject our behavior to a mental reflection, mental guidelines, mental standards, values, ideas, uh, possibility of rational uh, reflection which in the beginning it was simply the law of the jungle. I have the strength, the lion's share means as much as it can take, and the, uh, uh, and, and the rest is left over. So I think we, we, we bring back law uh, as a fundamental social process, in, in, inseparable from the other social sciences, uh, and, to under, and to understand law that way is to really you can hear the society growing. 
and you can see it in everything that happens and everything that comes in the media and the decision that's taken in the courts is the society either growing or taking a step back in reaction to something that frightens it or builds up too much resistance. And this is very much tied to the issue of power, which we'll come back to.